Welcome to the Knit Picks Podcast. This is Lee. I'm the Knit Picks Books and Patterns Graphic Designer, and I'm here with my friend Stacy. Hi, I'm the Outreach Director at Knit Picks. I deal mainly with the collections. Both of us work on the collections and all of that. One day I will have like an actual like intro line that I can use when I describe our jobs, but today is not that day. Again. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm pretty good. It's uh, I'm excited about gardening weather really picking up. Have lots of plant starts. I'm gonna start putting in the ground, so that's fun. Nice. Also been knitting a lot on our uh, yeah. knit along that we've been knit along check in. Yeah, we need to have like a we need to have like a like a like an audio knit along check in. <laughs> Get that set up, <laughs> Andy. Let me find you some. <laughs> 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 <Exactly>. <laughs> So I'm about halfway through. Um, I have had a lot nice. of knitting time over the past uh, couple of weeks. So I'm very excited. I love how my colors look. Um, I'm using Gogo Boots and Narwhal. <laughs> and I love how they look. So um, it's kind of funny, too, because sometimes the br- it's looking at it, it's like the brights always seem to line up with the brights in each skein. Hmm. And I was like, because we were talking in, I don't remember, in the in the office of, like, if we actually are, like, getting to, like, pulling out the color to see if we can start on the same stripe that we end mm-hmm. with when we're changing lines. I'm like, no, I mm-hmm. want to mix mine all up. But they're still kind of Yeah, I like the idea of different colors lining up with each other. Like, a, you know, a different color from C1 and a different color from C2 meeting each other on the different skeins. Yeah. 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 And I wouldn't mind like a semi abrupt uh, change because since it's striping back and forth between the two different colors, it's not going to be noticeable in the way that if you were knitting with just one skein of chroma by itself mm-hmm. and you had an abrupt color change, then it would be much more noticeable is how I feel about it. Cool. But yeah. yours is much <laughs> more exciting. <laughs> yeah. So I'm doing the sweater modification. I finished the one piece I right now I don't I'm not sure which is going to be the front and which is going to be the back so I I'm I'm thinking the first one is probably going to be the back but it depends how the second one turns out which I'm not going to know until it's done because of the na- the nature of the chroma stripes um so I finished the one I started the next I'm I finished the the ribbing I am doing the the um color work one by one ribbing so that took a little while finished that now I'm into the pattern and um I stopped at about, I think, like 21, 22 inches, and I'm not sure yet how I'm going to do the shoulders, if I'm going to add more, like, a neckline. So I'm going to work the second piece to the same size, and then once I have the two pieces, I think I'm going to block them so I know exactly what size they're going to be, and then I'm going to decide how I want to handle kind of the neck and the shoulders. So I'm excited for that to start taking shape. I'm so excited. I also... I wanted to um, tell y'all about uh, how I'm knitting the stitch pattern with stitch markers because the pattern is written without stitch markers, which was the designer's preference and which is many other people's preference as well. But all knitters are different. My preference is to use stitch markers. So we did include a note as for an optional um, stitch marker, you know, method. Just just a note, like, yeah, you can, and it's, like, pretty basic. Um, but I wanted to kind of walk you through if you like the idea of using stitch markers and want to copy me. The way I've been doing it is, so when you do the first flame pattern, you're using stitch markers to keep track of where the flames are so they don't have to count your stitches, basically. So when you do the very first flame pattern at the beginning, do it as it's written. But then when you finish the last stitch of the flame pattern, which the last stitch is going to be knitting the stitch together with the wrap and then it's done knit five more stitches and then place a marker and then do that mm-hmm. on both do that for the the two different flames knit knit five place a marker and then you're going to knit the next five rows just the back and forth back and forth um just slip the marker leave it where it is and then when you get to the next flame pattern you don't have to count your stitches you just knit to the marker and then that very last stitch that you knit before the marker is your wrap stitch so okay so i'm using german short rows so that means that i that means that i do knit the i knit right up until the marker but if you're using regular wrap and turns then you're going to knit to one stitch before the marker and you're going to wrap that stitch right before the marker so the idea is that the stitch right before the marker is touching the marker is going to be the wrap stitch and then that's that's the first row of your flame (laughs) pattern 
So that wraps that wrap is you know short row one of your flame pattern. So then you turn and you knit the whole flame pattern, and you complete it. And then when you complete it, you remove the marker, you knit five, you place the marker again. So you're jumping it over five stitches every mm -hmm. flame row, and then you do that until you get all the way to the last um, like edge flame where the marker is only going to be two stitches away from the edge, and then you'll. You know, look at the pattern and see what you're meant to do, which you're meant to do two flames that are on that last edge. So you're going to do one flame, leave the marker in the same spot, do another flame, leave the marker in the same spot until you go back to go the other way. Because then when you're going the other way, um, the, fl the flames are going to move back across in the other direction. So you're going to move the marker five in the other direction. So then at that point, you start moving five on the wrong side. So you... You know, work to the marker, oh. remove the marker, knit five, replace the marker on the wrong side row following the flame row. So you're just, you're oh, always see. bumping at five stitches, you're just going five over, five over, five over in, in the one direction and then back in the other direction, five over, five over, five over the other direction. And you can always, you know, ad refer to the pattern, which has all the stitches counted out for you to just mm -hmm. kind of make sure, wait, um, did I count five? Did I accidentally count four? <laughs> Whatever. And you can always you can also look at your wraps and see where your mm -hmm. wrap is and then see where your marker is. So lots of ways to kind of double check your work and make sure it's all working out the way it should. And I prefer it a lot. Um, it's totally personal preference. So just wanted to walk you through it in <laughs> case you want to copy me. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was actually suggesting uh, stitch markers in a different way when we were showing our coworker Carlene how to do short rows because she'd never done wrap and turn short rows. And I suggested okay. using locking stitch markers to lock to mark the wrapped stitch just because um, sometimes it's not as it's definitely um, when you're doing it in like lighter weight yarn, chroma is a little bit easier to see. But sometimes it's really hard to see which stitch you wrapped if you're not used to looking at it. Mm -hmm. So I just yeah. suggested she do that. And then when she picks them up, she knows exactly which ones to pick up. So. Yeah, that's a that's a great method for if you're new to short rows and you don't really mm -hmm. know what you're looking at yet to kind of get used to it for sure. Good idea. How's your work going, Andy? I know you're here listening in. <laughs> Hello, producer Andy here lurking in the background as always. Um, mine is coming along at a much more moderate pace. I I think so you have a sort of zigzag of rows to like as your flames move back and forth. And I have um, one zigzag and one zig done. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly my uh, one piece. One piece of my sweater is exactly one zigzag and one zig. <laughs> yeah. That's and, how long it ended up being. Um, so we were allowed to knit in the office, unsurprising for a knitting company. <laughs> Ooh, and yeah. I've been keeping that mine is. at my desk in the office and I pretty much only work on it um, during meetings. Like I've been knitting myself a little tank top out of uh, Shine Sport at home. And like, it's a really good meeting knit because like once yeah. you mm -hmm. kind of get the rhythm of it, it's really mm -hmm. easy to memorize. Yeah. I'm not using stitch markers on mine. I've... Uh, I've got a good memory for numbers, so I just sort of remember how the mm -hmm. numbers increase and decrease as you move back and forth, like mm -hmm. the stitch counts, I mean, because like you don't ever increase or decrease stitches once you start <laughs> the established flame pattern. <laughs> yeah. But um, I love it as like a sort of, it's more interesting than a mindless knit because yep. of the short mm -hmm. rows, but it still That's has... What I was gonna say all of those garter stitch rows that are like perfect for just like powering through while you're focused mm -hmm. on something else. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 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 I'm, I'm the same. I'm the same way. I, I once you it, like, I love this pattern because once you get the rhythm down, it is so simple in the best way. Just uh -huh. so easy just to go through. I mean, there has been a couple of times where, especially during a meeting where I will actually forget to do the flames on a flame row and I'll have to like <laughs> think back. Or I'll do that a couple times. I, there was one in a meeting recently where I was just like, oh, man, I really messed this up. But <laughs> I don't care. I love it. I love it. I That's will great. admit I had those moments, too. There were a couple times where I was like, this flame is 15 stitches long. Oh, like, yeah. What? <laughs> yeah. Some there of my was flames one are different I, ones. <laughs> I lost track of if I was on the 
going out, going in or going out. And I think I added a couple extra little short rows in there, just kind of went in and then out again and then in and then out again. I was like, what's going on, right? <laughs> okay, just rip, I've rip done it that out, a couple of over. times. <laughs> there's a couple of times, and I'm sure there's a couple of my flames that are not as big as the other ones because I think I did the same pr- thing. And I'm like, whatever, it's a design element. That's that's it. It's my artistic stamp on it. <laughs> Featured flame. Yes. It's gonna block out. <laughs> yes. Yeah. S- small mistakes are pretty easy to hide. So yeah. some of them I'm just like, nah, I'll leave it. Yeah. I'm like, it's like a, it's a giant wrap. If someone wants to focus in on this one little yellow flame that's on the in the first like 30 inches, then I cannot help you. <laughs> And uh, last week, we released our third mini stripe collection in that trio Yay. series of uh, ebooks. It's called Soft Stripes and Intersecting Lines. And it's Yay. another ebook of uh, five patterns. This one has uh, two garments and three accessories. And similar to the, the first two, but it's like we want it to be more springy, kind of uh, we call it soft stripes because the colors we chose were like soft colors. There are a lot of intersecting lines and a lot of perpendicular lines in this particular one. Yeah, that's what I was kind of going with um, when I was kind of when we picked these patterns, we kind of had them all. I was kind of trying to put them in different brackets for the three collections. And these I like the way. A lot of these had, well, intersecting lines or like different directions for the stripes, which is definitely what we were going for for all of these stripe patterns. But like, I mean, especially like for the Glennis bandana cowl or especially the switching stripes hat. I think both of those just show what you can do with stripes that are not just horizontal stripes on a sweater. So uh-huh. Um, yeah, and both of those have like perpendicular stripes and in, in modular sections. Yeah, um, interesting way. Yeah, yeah, and I wanted to, um, and and then because it was being released at the end of spring, early summer, I was like, well, we should go with some softer ones to kind of contrast it with the um, the really bright and bold colors we had for the other two collections. So this is for the softer side of the striping <laughs> and of course as with all of them you can choose your own colors yes, so it of doesn't course. have to be pastel you know do, do you do you <laughs> yeah. but i was really happy with it actually speaking of the glennis bandana cowl i chose the color the pixie chroma fingering color for it and i kind of went with that color use that as like an inspiration for all of the colors in it some of them were a little bit closer than than others but i kind of just like that as like a spring summer color way i really like that color of chroma anyway so i was like all right this is what we're gonna do <laughs> this is how i pick the colors. It's, it's a stripe between that colorway and the undyed like bare chroma <laughs> yeah. right so it's uh white so it's very bright cheerful springy mm-hmm. um yeah and i think we were talking um at some point about you know mixing different colors of chroma together like we're doing with our knit along that could be a really cool look um oh, with yeah. that pattern as well to use two different striping colors of chroma for like a very different look that would also work i think oh yeah definitely mm-hmm. i always i love well as as we've discussed i really like mixing <laughs> two different colors yeah. of chroma so <laughs> but this one i went with just more more subtle so yeah, it was um, a really fun collection. And then I w- when we were kind of, Hillary and I were getting together to discuss the um, the photo shoot, I was like, well, where, if someone was going to make this to wear in the summer, where would they wear it at? And I was like, well, maybe along a river, uh, you know, on a, on a morning or on long, or at least on the Oregon coast, like along the coast when you are going to be wearing those light layers. Mm-hmm. So we shot it on, the Columbia River, not too far away from the office, and it was a beautiful morning, like stunning morning, and like you know, you know, flat water. The model, um, we've worked with her several times. You'll probably recognize her on in other patterns on the site. Uh, she's gorgeous, and what I really love is that we actually used two models for this one, um, but we put the the sweater, um, the uh, Follow the Lines cardigan by Vera Maku. Um, I love that sweater. And it is one that you can use a lot of ease or a little bit of ease. So we shot it on two different sized models, one on the model at the Riverside. And then we shot it on our wonderful Isabel, who is <laughs> uh, who is my, who is smaller. And it looked great on both of them, I think, personally. So 
It's and a, she's, it's if a, you're not an obsessive listener, she's our uh, social media. Yes, person. sorry, I should have. So, so she's the one behind our Instagram and Facebook. I feel like stuff. everyone should know who Isabel is. <laughs> everyone should just know. <laughs> yeah. She's anyway, best. so it was really fun. I like doing that where we have two different sized models um, wearing the same garment and it looked gorgeous mm-hmm. on both of them. So you can yeah. kind of yeah. choose which size you want to knit on that, um, but it'll fit a wide r- variety of sizes. So. Mm-hmm. And I'm pretty sure even um, the recommended ease in the pattern, like the one size is like a little bit more than the mm-hmm. recommended and the other size is a little bit less than the recommended. Mm-hmm. So it shows how versatile it is. Or like, oh, if you're a little bit off and it's it's a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller, like it's still going to look good. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, I love that pattern anyway. That was one of the, um, I remember when we did the the uh, collection meeting, I remember that was one of the ones I really wanted to use because I really liked how the uh, the stripes are where it's like Uh the uh, alternating colors on each side. And I don't know, it looks really cool. So. Yeah. And it's, um, so what it is, is uh, it's just two color stripes, but like there's one color has more rows and the other color has fewer rows, but then there's kind of a, a faux seam up the back where it switches which mm-hmm. which color is which. So it's the same two colors, but they're like mirror like opposite on the two yeah. sides. So because it's a mirror cardigan, image. it's like that's what the, I was looking for. That was the word I was looking it's not, for. It's Thank not you. even exactly Quite. a mirror image. It's just like a it's a negative it's like a photo negative, right? Yes. It's like the colors are flipped. So like on the cardigan, it's like the two different panels are opposite. And on the back you see like the seam up the middle where they switch and it's like a very simple intarsia so if you haven't done intarsia before this might be a good introduction to intarsia because all you're doing is like flipping the stripes you don't have to worry about like a complex picture or anything (laughs) very simple yeah words are very difficult for me today apparently i can't think of the right words photo negative is actually a good one too i just like the way it looks so yeah yeah the other sweater is cool too it's um it has like kind of a top panel of stripes going in one direction Mm -hmm. like it's knit like side to side and then the Mm -hmm. the sleeves go off the same stripe pattern but then it has like a pocket that's like perpendicular stripes and then it has like a solid color body so it's like it looks like it would be a really like fun and satisfying thing to knit because like the top would go really quickly because you're just doing kind of the top panel and like the body will go quickly because it's just solid so, like, that's something that I look at and I'm like, oh, that looks like a fun to knit project if you're, like, a process knitter. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we should and, mention and that's... To, the, to wear, also. Yes. <laughs> uh, we should mention that's the Glory sweater from Megan Gonzalez. So, yes. and it is really cute. In. I was very excited yeah. to put some, some pink in there. I love that hot pink and I was very excited to put that in there. And then the last one we're, um, we haven't talked about is the Woven Socks by Karen Hicklin. She is a fantastic... Uh, sock designer. She also did the mm-hmm. refract socks from the uh, from the coloring outside the lines, and they are mm-hmm. just. Her, she has like this amazing eye for detail, and they're just amazing. They they look like they're woven, but they're not really. But mm-hmm. um, I kind really love are. these socks. They those two socks. If you like the one, you'll probably like the other because they use very similar technique of like um, carrying strands up to have like vertical stripes up. The so you have like. The, the rainbow, the refract socks have like rainbow stripes. So every yarn is mm-hmm. a different yarn, different color. And then the woven socks, um, I mean, you could actually do that because each strand is a separate strand, but it's designed to be like one strand is, or one color is all the vertical lines and the other color is the horizontal lines and then they weave. And what I love about both of those patterns is that they're asymmetrical. The left mm-hmm. and right sock are different. So both of them have like, one of the feet has the design on the leg and the other foot has the design on the foot, but in a way that's really like satisfying and, and coordinating. They they mm-hmm. look like a pair, but they're <laughs> different. Yeah. Cool. And that'll save you from second sock syndrome if you knit socks one at a time. It's like <laughs> totally. you're knitting two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess it might be a little bit more confusing if you knit them two at a time, but you know, it'll keep yeah. your interest. That's for sure. Mm. I never thought about that. <laughs> yeah, you'd have to really pay attention to what you're doing if you're, if you're going two at a time, huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so that is um, the Soft Stripes and Intersecting Lines book. Um, it is ebook only, and all the patterns are available for download along with the ebook on the site. So there'll be mm-hmm. links in the show notes. 
Yep. And again, it's the third of three stripey ebooks. So if you're into stripes, <laughs> make sure you check out all three of them. <laughs> I love I, them all. <laughs> I do too. And next, we're going to sit down and talk to Michelle Bernstein. So stay tuned. Move aside, mini candy bars. There's a new tiny star in town. Animation mini skein packs are the perfect yarn for toys, amigurumi, and other adorable little creations with 10 color-coordinated mini skeins of BK weight mercerized cotton. Animation mini skeins are so cute, you'll be tempted to display them whole. When you knit or crochet it at a dense gauge, 3D elements keep their shape without fuss. Find it on knitpicks.com. Hi, and welcome back. We are, Lee and I are now joined by Michelle Bernstein. Hi, Michelle. Hi, how are you today? Great. So if you haven't, um, Michelle has been around for a long time. I didn't even realize. I thought it was at least 10 years, but we just realized it's over 12 years. She's been part of the IDP uh, uh, IDP program. So I've known her (laughs) for that long. Uh, she's been in a lot of different collections, including Delicate Details, Little Luxuries, Mary Knitmas, Yarn Over, which has my favorite pattern, both sides now. I love that pattern so much. <laughs> uh, she specializes in elegant accessories with a fondness for brioche and entrelac. Would you say that is accurate, Michelle? I think that is very accurate. It's <laughs> mostly the brioche because I fell so hard for that in 2017 mm-hmm. and it has not let me go yet. Yeah, well, that's what um, the Yarn Over um, collection was mostly about. And that's what your Both Sides Now shawl was. Um, what You said it was a flat brioche? It's a flat brioche, half pie shawl. And I was so thrilled when you put it on the cover. It was just, it made my entire <laughs> year. <laughs> we all loved it. That was that was the star pattern. I mean, we love a lot of the patterns in that collection. But when that one came in, we were like... Oh, my God, look at this one. So (laughs) spectacular. (laughs) You know what was so hilarious about that piece? It's called Both Sides Now because it looks really good from both sides. Mm -hmm. But the side that I had designed to be the right side, the real right side, Mm -hmm. it wasn't featured in any of the photographs that you sent me when we were looking at the pictures (laughs) for the book. And I said, well, I know it's both sides now, but you should really see the other side, too. (laughs) I remember that. Yeah, because the... Yeah, that'll happen sometimes because the photo shoots are kind of disjointed from the patterns, you know, it's not, and it, and it, like you said, it looks amazing on both sides. So yes, it, it was an easy mistake to make to put it on and be like, that looks great. And just not really think yeah. twice about it. But I remember getting that email from you and being like, oh no. And I think we ended up like shooting it flat so that we could show it in the book. I think, I think. there's one where she's got it on her shoulders and you can mm. see it from the other side. Yeah, and yeah. as long as there was one to yeah. make sure. <laughs> about it is the the branches on one side they branch down and on the other side Mm -hmm. they branch up and the branching down side was my right side but your branches could be up (laughs) such a cool design thank you and then you've also done a book on your own at least one i think uh the brioche just one uh the brioche knit love uh you want to talk a little bit about that because i know it's kind of has some trials and tribulations right now Yes, that was my pandemic project. Um, Marie Green of Olive Knits came to me at the beginning of 2021, and she said, do you think you have a book in you? And I said, as a matter of fact, I think I do, because I had talked to another publisher the month before, and their idea of working with me on a book was, we're going to do some market research, and then we'll tell you what kind of book you're going to write and what the subject's going to be. And if I was going to do a book, it needed to be a passion project with something that I really loved, which was brioche. And so I was ready to jump in and go. So we did the book and it came out in October of 2021. And it was a teaching project. So I've got 21 projects in there and it starts at the very absolute most simplest brioche project. It's a a scarf in one color in super bulky yarn. And then it goes through and you learn how to do two color brioche and the round and flat and Um, increases and decreases that make the pretty patterning and ends up with three really beautiful pieces that I absolutely love. And then we sold out and (laughs) my publisher closed. So there was not going to be a reprint. So then I had to figure out 
how am I going to get my book out there? Because I don't expect to get rich off it. I just want it to exist. Mm -hmm. It was such a labor of love and I wanted it to still be available. Mm -hmm. So I've been looking through all these different ways to do it. You know, I could have them printed and then I'd have to warehouse them here at my house and be the distributor. And that was kind of way beyond what I felt like I was capable of doing (laughs) because I want to spend my time knitting and designing and teaching. Mm -hmm. So being a distributor was not my thing. And I finally landed last month on, um, working with Amazon through their Kindle Direct Publishing program. So it'll be super available. You can just order it on Amazon. And it's taken a little bit to get it formatted the way it needs to be. And I got my first proof copy. I ordered a proof copy. There's a big white stripe on the bottom of the front cover. (laughs) Actually, it goes all the way around to the back because it wasn't quite set up right. So the second copy is coming in a couple days. And if it's good, then it will be good to go. And by the time you hear this, it should be available. Awesome. The second part is that I think it's also going to be an ebook. I'm currently trying to figure out how to make that work, but I think I figured out their software and what I have to do to make that happen. And so that's that's been my big brain project. The I'm not knitting right now. I'm arguing with the computer, (laughs) which is, you know, it'll be done soon, I think. Oh, that's awesome. We'll definitely, we'll definitely put up a link, um, especially if it's oh, available. When, of course. We, yeah, because you, you know, you carried my book when it first came out. And that was super exciting because I had a blogger friend in Australia that if I were to send the book to her, it was going to cost $80 to send it in the mail. Yeah. But you guys shipped to Australia. And I don't know what magic you do, <laughs> but she got it from you. Oh, <laughs> right. that's, that's great. And then, so what have you been working on recently? I am taking a little brioche break and I am working with assigned pooling, which is a fun technique. The yarn has to be dyed for pooling. So it's got to have, when you see it in the skein, when it's a big loop, one end has, oh, maybe eight to 12 to 14 inches dyed in a pop color. And when you're knitting, when that color comes up, you do whatever fancy stitch it is that you are um, using as the feature. So the yarn tells you when it's time to do something. And I've been having this, you're not the boss of me. You (laughs) might suggest it there, but I don't want that right there. So I might or might not do the pooling stitch at that point. Because if they're all on top of each other, I don't really like that either. But it's it's a suggestion. (laughs) Oh, that's so funny. I'm designing a pattern right now in our new uh, Shine Multi, which is like that. It has like a pop color and I'm I'm doing exactly that. And I had orig- my original concept was to do a bobble on the pop color like every time, but they kept like stacking on top of each other. So I was like, okay, I have to change the design. So now I'm doing like slip stitches where you kind of slip with yarn in front, slip with yarn in back, back and forth. So the pop color weaves and a bobble so it's like depending if you want the bobble here do the bobble then weave until the end of the color and if you don't want the bobble here weave for an inch or two then do the bobble so the weave can either come at the beginning or the end so that you can like decide where you want your bobbles to be (laughs) that seems to be working okay (laughs) yeah i i published three i think three or four patterns already Mm -hmm. this year um and the end of the first three patterns, there's an explanation of, okay, the yarn is not the boss of you. And depending <laughs> on the dyer, you know, the, the length of your, your pop color can be long or short. And here are some things that you can do in case it's not doing what you want it to do. Nice. And you're still the boss of the yarn, even though it is assigned. <laughs> your so choice. I'm having a lot of fun with it. And I would love to try your yarn because I want to know what else we so could fun. do with it. Yeah, we oh, yeah. might even ha- be having some other yarn coming out in the future (laughs) which we can't talk about on the air but (laughs) oh okay you're gonna have to like sneak me an email or something yeah (laughs) michelle you live close to the office (laughs) come come see us in the office michelle as, oh, one, okay. yeah. as yeah. one thing we didn't mention, Michelle lives in yeah. Portland, so we, we're very familiar with Michelle. <laughs> but come by the office. <laughs> we'll show you around. Ooh, that okay, leads us cool. right into our next topic of you being local, yeah. which I don't know if we're ready to move on to our next topic yet, but it was a perfect transition. <laughs> <laughs> nice so, segue. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the Especially queen of segue. When you call it out like that. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, we're we're planning a Knit Picks Knit in Public Day event. And since you're local, we got to invite you to come be a featured designer at the event. And which and you've I done before so too, right? Yes, yes. Um, I went back and I looked through my blog. You may think my blog is just to put information out there, but it's also my personal journal. Yeah. So I put in WWKIP and up popped all these different times that I've done this with you. Nice. And the first one was in 2017, I think, which was fun. And cool. then every year until 2020, <laughs> womp womp. <laughs> Is this your first one since then? Did you do one last year? I can't yeah. remember. Our first official one, we did like an office one, like I think in 2021 and maybe 2020. Um, but yeah, our first like public one where we can like invite yeah. people to come and join us. So. I'm so excited. There was some overlap with like, you know, health concerns and then also like changes of brand managers and stuff and just like a lot of turnover where we were just like, ah, we can't like figure it out. I think that's what happened last year kind of. But this year we're like, okay, we're we're going to meet about it a few months beforehand. We're going to really put some effort into it, planning it, and we're really excited about it. Yeah. You know what I'm really excited about? Your venue You've got an indoor and an outdoor option because Mm -hmm. so many years, I've I've got all these pictures on my blog, we're huddling in a shelter under, (laughs) trying to avoid the rain. (laughs) Oh, yeah. And you have outsmarted the whole thing this year. (laughs) Yes. No grass growing here. Um, Uh (laughs) Yeah, no, I remember many of those times of like huddling under shelters in parks. This is the first year we're actually doing it in Vancouver where our office is. is. Um, cause most of us live in Portland, so we've been usually doing it in Portland and Portland's kind of more, a little bit more centralized for a lot of people, but we really wanted to celebrate Vancouver and our hometown. So it's going to be at the Hidden House event space on June 10th from 12 to 3. So if you are listening to this in the Portland, Vancouver area or outside of it, come join us and knit. It's going to be really fun. <laughs> And that's very specific. So if you happen to be local and you're listening to this, we would love to see you. Um, But if you're not local, you know, Knit in Public Day is cool because it's like I see a lot of people saying, oh, I knit in public every day. It's like, yeah, I do. I do, too. We all do. But it's a day to celebrate that. Right. It's a day to for everyone to be out knitting on the same day at the same time, wherever you live, you can meet new knitters. Um, I think of it as like recently there was indie bookstore day and it's like i buy books from indie bookstores every day any day but on that day i was like oh i'm gonna like make an effort to go drive to my favorite local indie bookstore and buy some books that day because it's a a thing i love to do and everyone's doing it on the same day and that's fun so yeah hopefully everyone can get out there get to you know park or coffee shop or whatever meet up with some people maybe meet some new people you haven't met before because everybody's knitting on the same day it's fun (laughs) and bring a friend too yeah you know what I know the community really loves it when you do these events because just people come. And the other thing that they really love about it is your raffle prizes are amazing and your free boxes of yarn are amazing and your books, (laughs) free books. People just, it's like a big glom. (laughs) I don't want to make everyone jealous who doesn't live in the area, but if you live in the area, (laughs) you 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 definitely want to be there. Even if you live a little bit away, you might want to drive to it. It's uh, you don't have to register beforehand or get a ticket it's free. It's just you know show up that day, so you can decide last minute. Yeah. <laughs> so we were going to kind of tie it into some of the other um, events you have done in the past, um, uh, Michelle. I'm going to talk about one of my favorite events that I did with you. I bet you can guess oh, which one that was. <laughs> I bet it was Knitters with Kidders. Wasn't yes, it, it was. <laughs> That was so awesome. (laughs) Yeah, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Well, it was at Purrington's Cat Lounge, and Purrington's doesn't exist anymore. They closed. I'm so sad. They sold, and then they closed. Um, Kind of got eaten by the pandemic, I think, because the sale went through right before, and then there was some remodeling, and then boom. I remember being really sad, and then really happy, and then sad again. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Yeah. But Purrington's was a cat cafe. You could go and hang out and pet the cats if that was what you wanted to do and have coffee or a little beverage or whatever snacks and the thing about Purrington's was it was really a showroom a showcase for adoptable cats from the cat adoption team down in Sherwood and which is where I got my cats from (laughs) <laughs> Which is where we got our cats, too. And my sons got their cats there, too. So Love they actually the got them at Purrington's. But 
Nice. Our last one we had to get at Cat Adoption Team because mm-hmm. Purrington's was closed for remodeling at that time. So we have a whole bunch of Cat Adoption <laughs> Team cats. But we had a little knitting event and some giveaways, and we just knit and hung out with the kitties, and it was really fun. And we featured your book, the is it Nine Lives? Yep, which was photographed there. So if you want to yeah, see oh, what, yes. what our old cat, what, what the old cat cafe looked like, you can grab a copy of uh, Nine Lives because that was that was fun. But that was a great collaboration. Thanks so much for doing that. Oh yeah. Um, hi. <laughs> we all love <laughs> yes. the cats here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, how did you How did you set that up? Did you work with them directly? I did. Um, I just talked to the owner because we were there all the time. You know, looking mm-hmm. at cats. Oh, need another cat. Let's go. And my kids, grown kids, they used to just hang out there before they had cats because they needed a cat fix besides coming over to our house. (laughs) And they got to know the people who worked there. And so I met the owner and I said, hey, you want to do an event? Seems kind of (laughs) perfect together, cat people and knitting. (laughs) And she was very open to it. So we did. What exactly was the event? Knitters with Kidders. (laughs) So it was like knitters all going to the cat cafe and knitting It was, a, how many could we have? Was it like 15 or 20 people? Max? Yeah. It was a, it's a small space. And mm-hmm. they would just come and knit and hang out with us and hope to win our special raffle prizes. Oh, nice. Yeah. It was just like a nice kind of gathering night. Um, actually, another designer, MK Nance, was there. Um, oh, yeah. Um, and okay. yeah, it was just fun talking. Honestly, I was just like, Michelle emailed me about it. And I'm like. Well, yeah, I'm I'm gonna go. <laughs> so, can you can you bring some swag? Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. I'll do. Cool. That sounds like so much work, but I guess I can make room. <laughs> yes, I can <laughs> hang out with cats and you. I mean, if I have to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What are some of the other events you've set up or uh, had taken part in? Do you have any um, favorites? I love doing Vogue Knitting Live. Mm. But Have you the one there? in New York, the first time I did was like, wow, this is like the previous Vogue Getting Lives that I did, but on steroids. It was <laughs> yes. amazing, just in Times Square. Because wow. I had done one in Columbus, and I had been to Columbus before in that same venue to do a trade show. And I thought, wow, this feels very familiar, and everything's great, and everything's very manageable. Then I did the one in New York and went, oh my gosh, it's like having the wind blowing through me. <laughs> so, <laughs> just wild. But it's really fun to be in person with other knitters. The other one I really love is um, Red Alder up in Tacoma at the Hotel Murano. That is a really nice venue. And the classroom's great. Um, The market is a nice, manageable size, and it doesn't feel overwhelming. So we have had a couple of those. It did get interrupted for the pandemic, but it came back. And we've had two years since it's been back. And that's that's really fun. I have to tell you where I'm teaching this summer, though. Yeah, where? I am teaching on a schooner out of Bellingham, Washington. Oh, my goodness. Oh, it's the fun. Nautical Knitting Cruise, K-N-A-U-T-I-C-A-L, <laughs> Knitting Cruise on the Schooner Zodiac. And it's, hang on, my, my wrist is buzzing, so I'm just going to make it stop. Um, it's from the yarn shop up there, which is Northwest Yarns. It's sold yeah. out. It's sold out immediately because, you know, you're going to have maybe 25 people on it, but we're going to be on it for two nights and that's going to cool. be cool. I've if you want to... a bigger, go ahead. I was just going to say, I've been to Bellingham one time and I'm pretty sure I went to that yarn shop because I would assume it's the only one. It's pretty, pretty small town and um, it was great. Spin Cycle I... has a shop up there too, which I have. Oh before. yeah. I think, I think yeah. when I went was before that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I loved that shop. That sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah. I'm also teaching on a Vogue knitting cruise to Alaska this fall in September. Ooh. I was oh. on their cruise last fall to Canada and New England. That was kind of fun. Wow. But now we get to go to Alaska. Wow. Cool. It's fun to teach knitting. <laughs> yeah. I when I used to teach, I went to Nashville one time. That was that was the peak. <laughs> the peak of my teaching was Nashville. That's <laughs> Which was cool. Great. I love Nashville. It, it was yeah. cool. It, yeah, no complaints. But, but yeah. Uh Alaska. Have you ever been to Alaska? You know, yes and no. So I when I was in college and before I was in college, I worked summers in a cannery on Kodiak Island, the far end of Kodiak Island. Wow. So we'd fly into Kodiak 
and then get on a seaplane and go to the other end of the island and there's nothing there except for the cannery and the bunkhouses and that would be my summer. So I started wow. the summer just before I turned 16 and I did it for five summers and it paid for college. Wow, that sounds like but, a TV show or something. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I haven't seen Alaska just to go look at it and and see more of it other than here is a cannery and you're at this cannery and you might climb the mountain behind the cannery and that's pretty much all you get to do. <laughs> and it'll be really nice to see it and not be covered with fish egg slime. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to it. Awesome. So did you have an experience of uh, virtual teaching and the pandemic? And could you talk about like the difference between teaching in real life and seeing people in person versus online and like blogging and just different kinds of like digital versus real life community kind of stuff? Absolutely. So when we shut everything down, it was right after um, the first Red Alder. And then it was, okay, now everybody's going to stay home. And I was supposed to teach in March that year, um, I think maybe April, for Vogue Knitting Live, and it was going to be in Seattle, and that one got shut down, but they pivoted so quickly, they turned around and said, would you be interested in trying to teach on Zoom, just doing a, a virtual event, and they had it set up and ready to go for a May event, which, I mean, that was an incredible turnaround, yeah. and I said yes to it, because you know, why not? What else was I going to be doing but hang out in my house doing nothing, just knitting? <laughs> and it was great. So normally when I teach in person for an event, like a retreat, it's a three-hour class. I taught two-hour classes for yarn shops, but three hours for an event. And it turns out when you're teaching online in a Zoom class, two hours is plenty because you've only got so much mental bandwidth, not me, but the students, you know, just how long can I sit here staring at the screen trying to learn how to do something? So two hours is fine, but it's actually, you're not getting less information. It's just not me running around the classroom for that extra hour, checking in on everybody. Mm -hmm. The wonderful thing that I've learned about teaching online is that everybody can see my hands at the same time. I use a document mm. camera and everybody's watching what my hands are doing. And the thing that is different is I don't get up and go around and check in with everybody. So it's up to people to say, hey, I have a question or whatever. But I found that I'm actually pretty good at having people hold their knitting up to the camera. And I'll say, no, nope, a little higher. No, no, put it right under your nose. Okay, now turn it around so I'm the knitter. And then <laughs> I can tell them what it is that they need to do. It's much easier to do it with it in your hands, but it's yeah. not impossible. And then... The best thing is that now that I'm teaching in person again at events, I bring my computer, I bring my camera, we hook up to a monitor or a projector or whatever, so everybody can see my hands at the same time, oh, just wow. like we've been doing. It's, it's really changed the way I teach. So yeah. now everybody can see my hands, and then I get up and I go around the room and see everybody's stuff, and it is the best of everything. So nice. I'm, you know, I'm not... Glad we had a pandemic, but I learned some really <laughs> good teaching techniques from it. Yeah. And I'm glad to have all of that in my toolkit now. Yeah, for sure. I teach locally for a yarn shop for yarn's sake, but we haven't actually, or I haven't gone back to teaching in person because we can reach more people doing it on Zoom. So my classes for them are still on Zoom. Nice. Yeah, I can see that. I'm sure that's definitely... Like people who aren't able to get there in the evenings or whatever, for whatever reason. Or from North Carolina, which is where one of my students was from this weekend. <laughs> so that works. Nice. So what you got coming up then, Michelle? Well, I am teaching for Virtual Knitting Live, or as we call it colloquially, Virtual Vogue Knitting Live. I think there's a thing about which words get to be in the title. Um, I'm <laughs> teaching a couple of brioche classes in June for them. And I'm teaching an assigned pooling class for For Yarn's Sake around my newest pattern, which is called Starfall. Um, it has a cascade of stars on a stockinette stitch background, and it is a bandana cowl. And it is my favorite thing that I've made so far. Oh, that sounds cool. Nice. As far yeah. as assigned pooling goes, you know, yeah. Rio <laughs> really has my heart. And that's just... <laughs> Can I just say, uh, for I think I'm pretty sure Stacy and I both heard 
assigned pooling as a term from you today for the first time, which is funny because I've actually designed assigned pooling patterns in the past too. I just never yeah. knew it had a term. I'd only heard the term plan pooling, which is different. They're two different things, which I learned from you today. So thank you. Yes. So the planned <laughs> pooling, you have a steady gauge and a certain number of stitches. And as long as your gauge stays on, your your colors are going to stack or mm-hmm. make argyles, depending on what it is you're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, assigned pooling, when the yarn tells you it's time, you do it. But I've also heard the term applied pooling, mm-hmm. and I keep trying to pull myself back from saying it because the term that everybody else is using is assigned pooling. So I too am trying to use this new (laughs) term. (laughs) Cool. Yeah. I designed a couple patterns back in like probably 2015 and 2017 or something that, that used that kind of technique, but it didn't have a name. So I just kind of explained what was happening. (laughs) It's kind of like the roll of the dice and you do what it. Yeah. It's when you, when you're holding a certain kind of yarn in your hand and you're just like, that one color is just popping off the background. I want to really make it pop even more. And it's it's a really fun way to design. I, I like it a lot. Yeah. My current piece that I'm working on, there's not a lot of tonal contrast between the main color, which is kind of Cheeto orange. I love it. Makes me hungry every time I do it. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's this hot pink, but there's not a lot of tonal contrast. And so I really mm-hmm. had to play with it when I was designing, you know, setting up the whole thing to make something else happen texturally so that the pop color would pop out more even though you know it's the same color against the same color Mm -hmm. but putting it on a garter stitch background instead of a stockinette background made all the difference and it was kind of an accident because I looked at the back of the piece and it was against the reverse stockinette and I thought Mm -hmm. oh oh that looks better (laughs) than the front Oh, but I don't want it to be reverse stock. Ooh, garter stitch. That would be perfect. So this is how I design by trial yeah. and error. You oh, do a little it. bit and it doesn't work. And so you rip it out and you do it again. Yeah. It's trial and error. And I like to say, I make the mistake so you don't have to. Yeah, yeah. I try it every different way possible so I can figure out what works best. And then that's the version that you get to make. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Love it. You know what I mean. (laughs) (laughs) But what else is uh, going on with you now into the near future? (laughs) Well, I just got an email from Stacy telling me it was time to look at the tech edits on a pattern. It's like, oh, yeah, that's still out there. That's still going to happen soon. Yeah, soon. Yeah, I mean, it, this is this is way in advance. This is a really beautiful pattern that won't be out until August, but we just did the mm-hmm. photo shoot yesterday for it, so I mm-hmm. it's it's lovely. Um I I can't wait to share it with the world because it's really beautiful. I can't wait to wear mine, but I can't wear it in public because, you know, it's a secret. Oh, and I pull- you can wear it. Don't be- you can well, wear it. <laughs> I pulled out my sample and I realized I have not yet sewn the ends in. I blocked it and everything, but the ends are not sewn in. Oh, I do that so all funny. the time, especially with hats, because the ends can just sit in- underneath the hat. You're never going to see them, so I just don't bother waving them in. <laughs> Ooh, that's, that's a dirty secret I shouldn't be telling yes. on the podcast. Um, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes when I do color work, I just tie the ends of the yarns inside Ooh. together and snip them off because no, no one's one gonna look inside <laughs> yeah it's what's the problem no one's gonna see it <laughs> oh wow i didn't realize we were going into our dirty little knitting secrets here oh no okay stacy your turn <laughs> what my dirty oh. secret <laughs> yeah i don't need to put you on the spot um i always weave in my ends <laughs> I don't oh, know. Oh, <laughs> boring. no i'm sorry um no, I can't. I, sorry, on the spot. We'll have to think about. Maybe yeah. that can be a topic for another podcast. We'll do another roundtable. Yeah. Or, ooh, ooh, uh, listener, write, write in, or leave yes. a voicemail with your dirty secrets, and we can do a whole episode about it. I never stuff. do gauge swatches. Is that one? Oh, <laughs> we would have something yeah. to say about that. No, it depends. You know, it, for me, it depends. Is it a garment or an accessory? How does it need exactly? To and it's, you'll it's, notice that I design accessories, <laughs> not garments. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, the best thing about um, editing that pattern. I looked at it and it said, blah, 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 blah. Video tutorial coming soon. <laughs> like, oh, I need to make a video tutorial. <laughs> so I um, did and I put the link in, but I might nice. do it. So we'll see. Because yeah, at we the very end, out. you could hear my husband in the next room. Like, oh, he's on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, 
Thank you for joining us today, Michelle. It's always a pleasure to hang out with you. Thanks um, for having me. I can't wait to hang out with you in person at Knit yeah, Public Day. Yeah. Exciting. And again, this is um, for our local um, listeners. It is June 10th, 12 to 3 at Hidden House Event Space in Vancouver, Washington. So come and join us for some fun and see Michelle and a bunch of her beautiful designs because she'll be showing them off. And maybe even a sneak peek of the one that we were just talking about. Oh, right. am I allowed to wear that then? Yes. <laughs> okay. I give you permission. Because <laughs> we'll probably you. have the sample. We'll probably have the sample there anyway. So. <laughs> okay. Mine's a yeah. different color. <laughs> Ooh, even better. All right. <laughs> Thanks again, Michelle. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Have a great afternoon. You too. This podcast was originally created by Kelly Petkin. It is produced and hosted by me, Stacey Winkleplek, and Lee Meredith. Produced by Andy Sutherland, with additional production and editing by Chase Ryan. Special thanks to Michelle Bernstein for joining us today. We recorded this episode in the Pacific Northwest, where we're celebrating Knit in Public Day on June 10th. From everyone here at Knit Picks, thank you for joining us. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the individual participants. They do not necessarily reflect the opinions or views of the Crafts Group LLC or Premier Needle Arts. All the yarn, tool, and patterns mentioned in this episode, along with all the inspiration a knitter could need, can be found on our website at knitpicks.com. If you'd like to be on our podcast, leave us a voicemail. We'll be checking it regularly and using your calls in later episodes. To leave a voicemail, call 360-334-4847 and record your message. You can also record a voice memo on your phone and email us that audio file at podcast at nitpicks.com. Like and follow us on your favorite social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, and YouTube at nitpicks. Rate and review us wherever you listen to this podcast. Until next time, happy crafting. Happy crafting.